Welcome back, my lovelies. Well, I should say lovely, because this video is dedicated to a friend of mine who is obsessed with the Ottoman Empire and demanded that I add at least one episode on the subject. I'm not quite sure what I will get in return, but I decided that I should be nice. So, here we go. In Eastern Europe, the Ottomans are usually viewed as foreign aggressors who conquered the Balkans and large parts of Hungary, causing the final separation from the western part of the continent, which enjoyed longer periods of peaceful development and was able to take advantage of the Atlantic trade routes. By that time, the lands dominated by the Ottomans were forced to follow a different path, which is why Eastern European people look at this period with a strongly negative opinion. Still, it's worth looking into the subject to see how and why the Ottomans were able to establish their own empire, which ruled over vast parts of free continents for centuries. Back in the 13th century, Anatolia, the territory which largely corresponds to today's Turkey, was dominated by the Seljuk Sultanate of Rum. The Seljuks had arrived from Central Asia in the late 11th century. They invaded the Byzantine Empire, along with Persia, Iraq, Syria, Palestine, and the Caucasus. Their empire didn't last long. They were defeated by the Mongols in the 1240s, then became their vassals. By the end of the century, the Sultanate of Rum was in disarray. Local beyliks managed to establish their own rule over smaller parts of Asia Minor. One of these beyliks was Osman, who lived just south of Constantinople. He extended the frontiers of his Turkish settlement toward the edge of the Byzantine Empire. His son, Orhan, captured the city of Bursa, ending Byzantine presence in Anatolia. And a few decades later, they even crossed to Europe, moving their capital to Adirne, or Adrianople, then capturing Thessaloniki and defeating the Serbs in the Battle of Kosovo in 1389. Breaking Serbian power in the region made it easier to expand. After that, not even an international coalition led by the King of Hungary was able to stop them in 1396 at Nicopolis. The Ottomans now held most of the Balkan Peninsula, along with roughly half of today's Turkey, so the next objective was a logical one, taking Constantinople and replacing the Byzantine Empire, which was now just a shadow of its former self. In this, they were temporarily stopped by Timur, who invaded Anatolia in 1402 and defeated the Ottomans in the Battle of Ankara even taking Sultan Bayezid I as prisoner. A civil war broke out between his sons, which ended 11 years later, when Mehmed I finally emerged victorious. The next Sultan, Murad II, managed to recapture most of the territories that had been lost in the Balkans, even defeating a large Hungarian-Polish-Wallachian army at Varna in 1440, where the king of Poland and Hungary, Vladislav, was also killed. Murad's main opponent was not the king, though, but Janusz Hunyadi, a talented general, who would stop Ottoman expansion for a couple of decades, although he lost another major battle, the Second Battle of Kosovo in 1448. His life and career deserve a separate video, which I will most likely add in the future. While the Ottomans were not yet able to crush the Kingdom of Hungary, they managed to capture the city of Constantinople, which was an even greater prize. Mehmed the Conqueror reorganized the state and the military, and finally took the city in 1453. Although Constantinople was no longer a huge metropolis, having lost access to Egypt and its large wheat supplies many centuries before. Now the city would take a new shape, as more and more Turkish settlers arrived, it would become the seat of a new empire, whose rulers regarded themselves Roman emperors, although their ethnicity, language, culture, and even religion were different to that of their predecessors. Due to previous conflicts with Western powers and a bad relationship with the Latin Church in Rome, the Orthodox Patriarch concluded an agreement with the Sultan. He accepted Ottoman rule 
In return, the Eastern Church would keep its lands and autonomy. The empire now included most of Anatolia and the Balkans, although Mehmed failed to conquer Hungary and was beaten badly in the Battle of Nandor Fehervar, or Belgrade, in 1456, after which John Hunyadi fell ill and died. The Ottomans would then try to conquer Italy and Rome. They even captured Otranto and surrounding areas, but then gave up on the idea as it would have required a lot more resources, and nobody was willing to take the risk after Mehmed's death. Historians disagree on the nature of the Ottoman state. Some claim that it was basically a continuation of the Byzantine machinery, with a dominant Turkish element and Persian cultural influence. Others say that the early period was simply about acquiring wealth and slaves. The spreading of Islam became important much later. It is undeniable that land ownership was an important element. For example, Spahi cavalrymen were paid in land for their services, and even after these lands could be inherited by their descendants, the system remained insecure, which meant that short-term exploitation was always more important than long-term development which eventually ruined the economy. The military itself, which was highly advanced and professional around 1500 AD, became extremely conservative and stagnant by the early 17th century, resulting in a huge Western European advantage as technological developments improved European armies and navies. The Ottomans adopted muskets and cannons early on. The Janissary was an elite fighting force composed of Christian youth who were levied and converted to Islam before undergoing military training. They were first a formidable force, only to become reactionary later on, hindering further development. Similarly, the navy was efficient and powerful in the 16th century, but then fell behind European rivals who continued to work on new methods and technologies. The state's primary objective was to maintain and expand the borders of the empire, spreading the Muslim faith while ensuring security within. It profited from the control over important trade routes that connected Europe to Asia and its exotic products. The House of Osman survived as a ruling dynasty until the early 20th century, which no other house could achieve, although on several occasions the sultan was deposed by a relative, or all close relatives were murdered on the orders of the sultan, who was also the caliph, essentially the leader of Islam. The women of the harem became very influential. For about a full century, they controlled the state. A grand vizier was somewhat independent from the sultan, with almost unlimited powers. This led to an important change by the late 16th century, when the Grand Vizier became head of state, as the sultans withdrew from politics. The administration carefully balanced between local and central authority. Its complexity aimed to integrate culturally and ethnically diverse groups. Dynastic law coexisted with religious law, the Sharia. Judges focused on local customs instead of legal precedent, which often meant that disputes were taken to many different courts before the desired result was achieved. In the late 15th century, Sultan Bayezid II had to fight for the throne. He then focused on domestic issues like rebellions and the promotion of both Western and Eastern arts. His successor, Selim I, managed to conquer the Middle East, defeating the Mamluk Empire of Egypt and becoming the guardian of the pilgrimage routes to Mecca and Medina. His reign lasted only eight years, but he was followed by the most well-known sultan, Suleiman the Magnificent, whose achievements we will discuss in the next episode. With this, another important task is done. I'm finally free of such obligations, so in the coming weeks I will return to the topics I started with, adding new videos to each playlist on my channel. Hopefully, I will be able to upload at least two videos every week, but this will depend on how much free time I have. See you in my next videos.